Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, hosted by a man who may or may not be wearing pants. If you can't tell, why should I? As promised, today we're returning to the world of M. Night Shyamalan, and we're looking at his first real box office bomb, Lady in the Water. Believe it or not, there was a time when it seemed like Shyamalan could do no wrong. From the late 90s to the early... 2000s? Early zeros? Aughts? Oddies? Naughties? What is the right term for that decade? Anyway, during... that time, Shyamalan had a string of extremely popular movies. The Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, Signs, and technically Stuart Little. Critical opinion wasn't always overwhelmingly positive, but these films made money hand over fist. Hell, The Sixth Sense made just under $673 million. And that's 1999 dollars. But with 2004's The Village, it looked like his magic was starting to wear off. The movie still made good money, but its box office revenues were significantly less than signs two years earlier, and critical opinion was mixed, if we're being generous. So the powers that be at Disney, who produced Unbreakable, Signs, and The Village, were naturally a bit skeptical when Shyamalan turned in his screenplay for his latest movie, Lady in the Water. In fact, Disney executive Nina Jacobson was reportedly quoted as saying, Not buying it. Not getting it. Not working. The story of Shyamalan trying to sell Lady in the Water was chronicled in the book The Man Who Heard Voices, or How M. Night Shyamalan Risked His Career on a Fairy Tale. And while Shyamalan didn't write the book himself, it was clearly made with his blessing, and essentially paints him as a misunderstood genius going up against the evil studio executives who don't care about original storytelling. They just want to make money. You'd think they were running a business or something. <laughs> the nerve. Now, Shyamalan is hardly the first director to clash with studio executives. Hell, I spoke extensively about Josh Trank's troubles with 20th Century Fox in my last episode. But most filmmakers don't write a tell-all book about it, and most don't have their heads this far up their own ass. But M. Night Shyamalan is not most filmmakers. Don't get me wrong, he has moments of greatness, but they're just that. Moments. And it looks to me like at some point he started to let his own hype go to his head. The man couldn't see his own shortcomings if they jumped up and bit him in the face, and seems to be convinced that anyone who doesn't see his true genius is either stupid or has an ulterior motive. It's a wonder he hasn't run for president. Despite their problems with the script, the people at Disney were still willing to make the film. But I guess Shyamalan decided if they couldn't truly appreciate his genius, they didn't deserve to make his latest masterpiece. So he took his ball over to Warner Brothers, who were more than happy to produce the movie in Disney's place. So let's take a look at Lady in the Water and see what true genius from a visionary director looks like. The movie opens with a bunch of crudely drawn stick figures explaining the movie's poorly thought out premise. Well, we're off to a great start. Once, man and those in the water were linked. Those in the water? You mean fish? They inspired us. They spoke of the future. Man listened, and it became real. But man does not listen very well. Wait, did man listen, or did he not listen? We're not even a minute in, and already I'm confused. So I guess over time, man stopped paying attention to those in the water and moved further inland, and the water people were like, eh, fuck it, we tried. And then man became more warlike, and we started killing each other, and one day we launch a nuke at China, and China's like, shit, shit, who the fuck is shooting us? Oh well, fart, wait. I might be mixing up my stories. But now, I guess the people of the water have decided to risk being eaten by ROUSs to give man another chance. Don't worry, this'll all make sense never. But man may have forgotten how to listen. I thought we already established that. So here's our protagonist, Mr. Cleveland Heap, played by Paul Giamatti. Once upon a time, he was a doctor with a wife and child, but after they were tragically murdered, he left his former home and profession and took up a job as a repairman for an apartment complex in Philadelphia. And this complex houses some rather bizarre characters, like this dude who only works out one half of his body in the name of science or some such bullshit. I call him Chekhov's douchebag. You'll understand why later. The complex's newest resident is Harry Farber, played by Bob Balaban, a film and book critic for the local newspaper. Yep, Shyamalan actually put a film critic in his movie. And he's kind of a self-absorbed jerk who spends most of his screen time loudly complaining about everything. 
because that's all critics ever do, right, Mr. Shyamalan? It's just non-stop negativity. They certainly never had anything positive to say about your movies. Oh, wait. Anyway, one night, Cleveland catches someone swimming in the pool after dark, which is a big no-no. This somehow leads to him falling on his uncoordinated ass and into the water. Fortunately, he's rescued from drowning and wakes up later in his apartment with a scantily clad woman. Man, if I had a nickel. This woman, played by Bryce Dallas Howard, is known as Story. You heard me correct. Her name is Story. Oh, it gets better. She apparently belongs to a mythical race of people called Narfs. She's Story the Narf. Narf! Yep, it's gonna be one of those kinds of boobies where everyone and everything has a silly, nonsensical name. Kind of like Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, except without the charm. And the interesting characters. And the cool special effects. And the coherent story. Actually, it's nothing like Fantastic Beasts. Forget I said that. And get used to that expression on Bryce's face. It's the only one she's got. And I know she's a better actress than this. Hell, even in Twilight she gave a decent performance. And that's not easy to do. But in Lady in the Water, acting was apparently not an option. Just stare at the camera like your heroine just kicked in. There's actually a lot of staring at the camera in this movie. It's kind of weird. Mr. Shyamalan, you do know that having your actors look directly at the camera is generally frowned upon, right? Oh, but far be it for me to question your genius. Anyway, Cleveland now knows Story is a narf, but like the rest of us, he has no idea what the hell a narf is. So he turns to one of his neighbors, a college student named Yung Soon, played by Cindy Chung, with a terrible fake Chinese accent. University gives as many pages of reading. What they think, I have no social life? You know, I'm half Irish and I can't exactly do a convincing Irish accent, so I probably shouldn't be throwing stones at a Chinese woman who can't do a convincing Chinese accent. But I am going to ask why Shyamalan had her do the accent in the first place. I mean, it doesn't really add anything of substance to the character. Is there some reason why she couldn't just use her normal voice? Oh, but there I go, questioning your genius again. So it turns out Yung Soon's mother knows the origin of the narf. It's an Easter bedtime story, Mr. Heap. Oh yes, because the word narf sounds so obviously Eastern. But her mother won't tell the story unless she sees Cleveland as a child, for some reason. And that leads to... this. It's a beautiful story. Oh. Are, there, are there any parts that might be good to hear? Ooh. Did you hear that? I think that was the sound of Paul Giamatti's dignity committing suicide. Well, this is Story's, uh, story. God damn it, Shyamalan. Story is a narf from the Blue World, but she is not an ordinary narf. She's a Madam Narf, and she has been sent here to find a writer and inspire him to write a great book. Once she has fulfilled her task, she can return home with the help of a giant eagle known as an Eatlon. But she is being hunted by something called a Scrunt, a giant dog-like creature that can camouflage itself in the grass and humans can only see it through a mirror. Some monkey-like creatures known as Tartutic have put rules in place to prevent a Scrunt from attacking a Narf, but this Scrunt has apparently said to hell with the rules and it's gonna try to kill Story anyway. So in order to get home to the Blue World, she needs the help of a Guardian, a Symbolist, a Guild, and a healer. And if it sounds like I'm just making this shit up as I go along, that's because it's basically what Shyamalan did. Lady in the Water is based on a series of bedtime stories he made up for his daughters. Genius. Now maybe if you're a dumb four-year-old child this story might work for you, especially if you're trying to fall asleep. Hell, the pace of this story is so slow at times I have trouble staying awake while watching it. But for anyone who is old enough to tie their own shoes, it's an incoherent mess. How did Story get here in the first place? Why does Story need a giant eagle to return home? Why does the Scrunt not want Story to return to the Blue World? Why can humans only see the Scrunt through a mirror? If there are rules in place to prevent a Scrunt from attacking a Narf, why is it so easy to ignore these rules and attack anyway? And what the fuck is a Tartutic? I'm guessing the answer to all of these questions is shut up and go to bed. Which might work on your own children, but not so much the movie going public. Oddly enough, one critic actually suggested that if Shyamalan is going to use his children to judge the quality of his work, perhaps he should start making movies for Nickelodeon. 
Little did he know that would prove to be an even worse idea. Speaking of critics, in order to find the people that are supposed to help Story, Cleveland turns to Harry, for some reason. And this is where things get weird. The critic is able to describe each person Cleveland is looking for, symbolist, healer, and so on, since they're all based on archetypes. It's almost like Shyamalan is deconstructing his own movie and pointing out how cliched his characters are. There is no originality left in the world, Mr. Heath. You know, Mr. Shyamalan, sir, pointing out your movie's flaws doesn't magically make it any better. The flaws are still there. All you did was make them more obvious. So Cleveland manages to find all of Story's supposed protectors and the writer she's supposed to meet. And look who it is. Yep, it's M. Night Shambles on himself. Typically, he has a cameo in his own movies, but this time he decided to cast himself as a major character. This probably wouldn't have been a big deal if he was as good at acting as he thinks he is at storytelling, but his performance leaves much to be desired. And here's the real kicker. According to Story, he's not supposed to write just any book. He's writing a book that will change the world as we know it. It will inspire a future president who will grow up to lead the world into a new era of prosperity. But apparently the ideas in this book are so radical, so controversial, that the author will one day be assassinated. Knowing his actions will ultimately lead to his untimely death, the author decides to write his great novel anyway, bravely sacrificing himself for the greater good. Oh, what a guy. Is this really how Shyamalan sees himself? A great storyteller who will one day change the world? Good lord. I've heard of vanity projects before, but this... This is just blatant auto fellatio. I don't think I'm anything special. Oh, really? Anyway, the group hatches a plan to get Story safely to the Great Eatlon, which involves throwing a pool party. Just go with it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, and the Scrunt somehow manages to attack Story without anyone at the party seeing it. Bullshit! It doesn't quite kill her off, but she is badly wounded, and our heroes start to suspect they're not actually the heroes. I... asked someone. He acted like he knew. What kind of person would be so arrogant to presume to know the intention of another human being? Oh, fuck off. And as if that wasn't enough, the Scrunt actually kills the critic. Jesus Christ, Shyamalan, how petty can you get? Even Roland Emmerich didn't kill off Siskel and Ebert in his crappy Godzilla movie. And if Roland freaking Emmerich is showing more restraint than you, it's time to take a step back and reevaluate your life. Anyway, they quickly figure out who the real symbolist is, and conveniently, it turns out to be the son of the man who they thought was the symbolist. Now, the original symbolist was acting as a prophet by interpreting crossword puzzles. Yes, crossword puzzles. But if you can believe it, it's about to get even more absurd. His son, who is the real interpreter, reveals the prophecy by- I'm sorry, are you sitting down? Because you really should be sitting down for this. Okay? Okay. He reveals the prophecy by- Are you sure you're ready for this? I'm sorry, I, I just- I want to make sure you are adequately prepared for the utter ridiculousness that is to come. Because this is peak Shyamalan. Oh yeah. You ready? Good. He reveals the prophecy by... Reading cereal boxes. And it works. It actually fucking works. This is the most amazing thing I have ever seen. I don't know what the hell's going on in the most wonderful way. We need a man who has no secrets and one whose opinion is highly respected as witnesses. As foretold by the prophet General Mills, they shall bear witness to the great Eatlon in all his majesty. And it shall come to pass that we shall all truly be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Amen. So they finally figure out who is supposed to be the guild and the healer, for real this time, and Story is revived. Oh, and remember the prophecy also called for a guardian? Well, guess who it is? That's right, it's Chekhov's douchebag! 
This crazy motherfucker who hasn't been involved in the story in any way since the very beginning is the one who has the power to stare the scrunt into submission. Until the Tartutics suddenly show up and kick its ass. Where the fuck have they been this whole time? Why did they suddenly show up now? I have no idea. And with that, the great Eatlon can finally carry Story to safety. But what will become of our heroes? How will they lead their lives after this extraordinary experience? Will Cleveland finally come to terms with his family's passing and go back to practicing medicine? Will the author live his life in fear knowing that he will one day be murdered? Will Chekhov's douchebag ever start working out his left arm? I have no idea because that's the end of the movie. No, for real. The eagle picks her up, they fly off, roll credits. That's it. Well, what was even the point then? Suffice to say, this movie is an absolute mess. The story is ridiculous, the pacing is awful, the acting is subpar, the characters are silly, and the ego just oozes off the screen. And the titular lady in the water doesn't actually do anything. She just sits there with that blank expression on her face and lets stuff happen to her. To be fair, it's not all bad. James Newton Howard's score is actually pretty good, and Paul Giamatti's performance is far better than this movie deserves. And there are moments where this movie crosses into so bad it's good territory and gets downright hilarious. But there are also moments where it's far too boring to be enjoyable, no matter how silly it is. And seriously, I just cannot get over what an ego trip this is. The balls on this guy! Unless you're a Shyamalan completist, I don't think I can recommend this one. Well, December is coming up, so I guess that means it's time for another Christmas movie in our next episode. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. special.